So welcome to this rather philosophical contribution on crises, coil projects, and humanities, which I think denote three components um, that combined, I believe, to have immense potential to tackle pressing issues of our time. You may have heard that global societies are experiencing many crises. From unaffordable housing to rising energy costs, from military conflicts to climate change, political extremism and the recent pandemic, much of what makes the world a good place to live in seems to be out of order. Putting it negatively, we have been through a lot. Putting a positive spin on it, we have grown with the experiences we've made. When looking for ways to respond effectively to these crises, we have learned from past mistakes that constructive measures must entail different perspectives from different disciplines to evaluate its impact on our health, the economy, um, and the mental, uh, for example, as in the pandemic, um, the impact on our health, the economy, and the mental state of children and adults. With now war raging in the midst of Europe, we rely on politicians, military experts, as well as the practice of ethics and empathy to evaluate the situation thoroughly and hopefully create solutions um, that head towards a peaceful future. Climate activists, yes? It's, it's all coming. I'm a minimalist in that regard. Climate activists have become experts in their own right, being highly educated both in the scientific facts as well as the question of social justice or injustice um, that can result from a neglect of the issue. So problem solving in the 21st century seems to be a collaborative endeavor. And this is, of course, the C in COIL. COIL has been lauded as an inclusive and democratic learning and teaching format where our, student, where our future professionals from different social and cultural backgrounds come together and share their perspectives. We've heard many examples of this by now, also in this conference, and it is rightfully regarded as a low threshold tool to guarantee um, interdisciplinary exchange, as well as providing a setting for making intercultural and international experiences, even in situations where mobility is limited. Its virtual setup also implies a flexibility to integrate these encounters into lives that are busy with responsibilities, such as caregiving, if you have to do that, but also working while you are studying. So it's a collaborative endeavor, and when done best, creates communities and safe spaces where learning together is made possible. In our COIL seminar, you can combine expertise from across the globe and introduce a plurality of opinion in different ways of life to your students. COIL projects also serve as training platforms where skills needed to effectively engage in global societies um, of today can be developed and enhanced. And these skills are an intricate network of components that we expect that we expect um, students of today to be equipped with. And this is usually what you will find listed in the literature um, when it comes to what skills students um, should be trained in. As educators, internationalization experts, and university administrators, we hope to send our students off as global citizens, um, fully aware of the world, its challenges, as well as its opportunities. Douglas Bourne describes in his book on understanding global skills that the skills we practice with our students must be framed within understanding of development and global themes with the overarching goal to transform acquired knowledge into applied knowledge, um, ultimately leading to responsible action. And I have two more quotes that align with this definition of um, what responsible action is. Unfortunately, I don't have it here on my computer, so I have to head over. Is this on? Or maybe your microphone? So this uh, first definition that I'm introducing here is by Torres, who says, we should view citizenship as marked by an understanding of global interconnectedness and a commitment to the collective good. We should advance a view of citizenship in which the geographic reference point for one sense of rights, rights and responsibilities is broadened and in some sense complicated by a more expansive spatial vision and understanding of the world. 
and the second definition is by UNESCO, um, where it says global citizenship education aims to empower learners to engage and assume active roles, both locally and globally, to face and resolve global challenges and ultimately to become proactive, proactive contribu contributors to a more just, peaceful, tolerant, inclusive, secure and sustainable world. Bond details the idea of responsible action further by arguing that abstract concepts such as critical thinking, which we always mention in that regard, and problem solving must translate into clear and precise non-communicative acts. When negotiating measures for local and global communities, what is needed are direct demands um, directed towards policymakers and also individual accountability when it comes to the needs of global societies. Context, he continues, are of the utmost importance um, as responsible action does not come with a one-size-fits-all definition but depends on the needs of the respective societies. This, in turn, must be exchanged within an international setting, as local inequalities often stem from injustices um, that were created by the process of globalization, um, where the definition or, or parts of, global, of globalization or what is usually explained about globalization is that this is an uneven economic process with an unequal access to resources, and this should be considered when working on solutions as well. So experts working on global citizenship um, also agree that skills alone are not sufficient to tackle today's problems. The Council of Europe, for example, um, have published a model that defines skills as only one out of four aspects um, that together make competences. And, and the emphasis is really on you need to bring competences um, as a global citizen when you enter the world. As a teacher of literature and cultural studies, I am frankly vindicated to see that all four areas are premised on discourses ingrained in the culture of the humanities. And I am reminded of what Teskeen Adams said um, yesterday in her keynote speech, um, where she called this philosophical underpinnings. Um, I'm calling this the humanities. So questions of power, representation, ethics and empathy are inextricably linked to theories that are part of our cultural heritage. I cannot help but think of Bell Hooks's work, for example, on intersectionality when I see that cultural diversity is emphasized in this model. Um, I also think about what we teach our students when we tell them to build strong and convincing arguments um, when I see that critical thinking is mentioned here. And I'm also reminded of Foucault and his um, work on knowledge, discourse and power um, when, I, when I look at um, how knowledge is uh, mentioned in this model. And how much we need these philosophical foundations, I think we see best when we look at examples, um, I will skip this, uh, when uh, we look at examples of um, modern day algorithms and the biases that we find in them. So on the left hand side, for example, um, this was um, investigated by a student who found out that Twitter algorithms push images and circulate images a lot more frequently if they ad adhere to Western beauty standards, meaning if the, if the image is of a white person, of a younger person, um, that image will be circulated a mo lot more frequently than um, images of someone who is not white um, and someone who is maybe older or not perceived as adhering to Western beauty standards. In the middle there, you can see um, an example of um, a soap dispenser, or soap dispensers in general, that have sensors instead of you having to touch them. They have sensor by putting your hand below the, the uh, soap dispenser. They're supposed to give you a certain amount of soap. This does not work in some cases for people who have darker skin because the sensor is not able to reflect the light as well. So these are very concrete um, discriminations um, that come with AI, that come with technologies, um, that need to be interrogated by the humanities also. Ruha Benjamin, 
who is a professor of African American studies at Princeton University, describes these biases as codes. She says, some people are already coded in real life, um, by, and by that she means that some people, just based on their looks or in, on the way that they appear to us, um, they have a specific code, specific theory, stereotypes. And this is often translated into the virtual space as well. She says codes are even more than stereotypes. More than stereotypes, codes act as narratives, telling us what to expect from a group or from an individual. Most important then is the fact that once something or someone is coded, this can be hard to change. Codes, in short, operate within powerful systems of meaning that render some things visible, others invisible, and create a vast array of distortions and dangers. And she describes this as um, the new Jim Code, which of course um, is derived from Jim Crow, the caricature of a black person that was used in the 20s in the US, for example, um, to basically discriminate against, um, against people of color. And derived from that, she says, what we have in the virtual space is the new Jim Code, which describes the employment of new technologies that reflect and reproduce existing inequities but that are promoted and perceived as more objective or progressive than the discriminatory systems of a previous era. So, um, the reason I mention this is that technological developments need philosophical consul consultation as well as integration to prevent the reproduction and circulation of centuries old um, trop tropes and biases. So it is necessary to also approach digitization collaboratively to create justice-oriented societies, both in virtual and non-virtual spaces. My emphasis on collaboration is also directed towards the discipline of humanities, where we usually still have the idea that scholars who research in literature or philosophy create knowledge and wisdom in their own isolated studies, um, isolated from other disciplines. So we were very aware of that when we created our COIL project in the summer of 2022 in, intercultural, um, in international cultural studies, where we made sure that interdisciplinarity um, was at the forefront of our agenda. This was a joint project between the Salem State University um, in Massachusetts and the University of Mannheim. So finding a partner for us was easy because the Salem State University has been a long-term partner university. What was less easy was integrating this course into the curriculum of Salem State um, due to their lack of flexi flexibility when it came to the formats of their courses as well as the content. Um, so this ended up being an extracurricular course um, for those joining us from Salem. And we had a, an immense power and balance um, in, in terms of numbers. So we had 25 students joining from Mannheim because this was a regular seminar for them, but only five students joining us from Salem State. So you can see the imbalance there. And also international cultural studies in Mannheim is a subject that students from all six departments that we have at the School of Humanities must attend. So that means that they were very well aware of what's coming um, and what the contents of the courses would, this course would be, the Salem State University students were less aware um, of what to expect. So these factors combined, the imbalance in numbers as well as um, the imbalance in expectations, led to Mannheim students being um, a lot more dominant in the weekly discussions than the Salem State Universities, uh, University students. And we tried to offer as many opportunities as possible for students to speak amongst themselves in breakout rooms and thought it would be best to set up fixed groups right from the beginning, um, also uh, regarding the group projects in the end, which some students liked and others disliked. Some students um, said in the evaluation they would have preferred mixing up the groups every now and then. Others said they built friendships um, throughout the semester and they are still in touch. We also involved guest lecturers. I'm, not, I, I'm sure you can't see this, but um, this was the syllabus, sorry. And um, we involved guest teachers from other disciplines as well, economy, for example, history, literature, and provided clear instructions that this was a seminar, not a lecture series. Um, some of them um, 
some of them did that and could provide that and others still um, gave uh, more passive input, but both was liked by students just as much, I think. So um, this structure helped us gain insights um, over the course of the semester, but some students felt overwhelmed by the density of the syllabus as well. So this was a mixed bag. But what we did learn together, and I think this was really the main takeaway, was that crises affect different groups in different ways and that our perception of the world varies depending on context. For example, when students were asked what they thought the most pressing issues of our time to be, the students from Mannheim said, obviously it's climate change as well as military conflict in Europe because the Russian invasion had just happened. When the Salem State University students were asked what they thought uh, or what they were the most worried about, they named healthcare as well as the housing crisis. And this of course can be explained um, because the, the cultural context and the experiences were so different. What we also learned together was um, from reading key texts in cultural studies that there is a strong correlation between how we understand and interpret texts um, depending on which cultural context the students grew up in. So when we were reading, for example, Edward Said's Orientalism, it was unclear what the Orient actually was and what was, was referring to. Of course, for us in a German context, this would mean something else than somebody in the US context who thought um, the Far East to be um, what the Orient was. And that, of course, then changed the meaning of the text entirely, um, which is something that we had to address as teachers and frame very carefully um, because we were talking about stereotypical representations. The biggest issue we faced was the assessment. Um, so for the Salem University, um, they did not have to write any term paper. The only thing they did was write a short essay and then um, being part of the group projects in the end, and that was graded and that was it. My students from Mannheim University, they had to submit a term paper of 10 to 15 pages because that, again, was the lack of flexibility of our exam regulations uh, that stipulated that we have to have them submit a term paper and grade only the term paper. So the group projects, um, which took, a lot of, took up a lot of time, uh, we could not grade. And that uh, was a source of much frustration, I think rightfully so. So overall, I think the evaluation showed us that we had reached our learning objectives. We had provoked students to step out of their own um, frames of reference and develop an openness um, towards perspectives on the world and crises that deviated from their own. And if I was asked uh, what I would change about this course, I think the main thing that was my takeaway as a teacher is that you need a lot more space for reflection than um, you would you would expect. So we, on a meta level as well, discussing what is COIL, what is it that we're doing here, address maybe the awkwardness that comes with meeting people from different contexts, talking about sensitive things. So um, this is something that I would advise everyone to do. I think COIL overall is a powerful tool in education and unique in what it contributes to facilitating the process of, globe, of becoming global citizens. But the one thing I want to mention towards the end is um, that it cannot, as of now, it cannot bridge all of the gaps that we know. And the digital divide, of course, is the one thing that we've already heard about. I think also when it comes to the digital divide, um, perspectives from the humanities are needed. Um, a study, for example, in 2020, in the height of the pandemic, showed that there was a huge divide, not only between rural areas and cities when it came to internet bandwidth or the access to the internet, but also depending on age, gender, um, as well as location in the world. And the gender issue um, I want to quickly get into because I think that is important. Um, so these are two different studies. The one um, on the right-hand side was conducted in 2019. The one on the left-hand side is the more recent one. Um, but I still wanted to show you this map. So according to this map, worldwide, um, men are 21% more likely to have access to the internet or to devices that they can use than women. If we consider only poorer or developing countries, this rises to 52% of men being more likely to have access and to be, or, 
and or to be able to use technological advice, uh, devices. So sometimes this is because women do not own any devices. Sometimes it's because they do not have the proper training to use the, um, these devices. devices. Um, but I think this is something that needs to be interrogated also in the sense of from the perspective of gender studies, why is this discrimination very visible in how internet access is distributed um, in the world? So my, um, my, the last thing that I want to say about this is that values such as ethics and empathy must be built into the virtual structure. Um, questions such as why is this unequal, why is this unequal distribution even possible um, must also build into the virtual structure to prevent hegemonies and power imbalances. These, um, the one more thing I want to show is that this is not just something that's banal or something that can be bridged easily, um, because when we talk about digital natives, it's important to define that group and it's I don't think, a ro I think it's a wrong, assumptions, a wrong assumption to say that every part of the younger generation um, is a digital native. So the UNESCO defines this as the generation of technological acceleration of the internet and its networks. Growing up in such an environment, they think and process information in a totally different way than previous generations. Their thinking patterns have changed and it is likely that their brains have physically changed too. So if we consider this, that a digital divide will lead to physical changes in those who have the privilege of having access and leaving those behind who do not have the privilege of that access, I think the consequences are quite drastic. So I think uh, it is important that we expose these inequalities and that we strive to empower students of all genders, all ages and from all social and cultural backgrounds. Thank you so much. Thanks, Abia, um, for this really inspiring talk. Um, very interesting topics that you had in your coil. And we have about two to three more minutes for a few questions. I know it's late, but <laughs> I'm sure there are some questions. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, a, a plethora of really interesting ideas, thank you. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned the deployment of the idea of the four aspects of ideal democracy um, from the Council of Europe, and sometimes COIL um, or virtual exchange facilitates an interaction between diametrically opposed views. So for example, um, democracy versus apartheid, coming from a culture where that might not be valued as much or viewed in the same way. Uh, so my question, I guess, is how can, how can COIL be designed so that meaningful learning can still happen in that context? How can, uh, how can you promote um, a third space discussion somewhere in between those two poles? Yes, I think that's an important question and thank you for that. I think it requires a lot of careful framing from the beginning and um, also careful preparations from, um, I think the teachers are really um, the ones who are in charge of making sure that Western perspectives or Western ideals um, are not the dominant ideas um, within that space, even if we feel that whoever is joining us um, maybe on the wrong path or may represent something that we cannot necessarily agree on. Um, but that is part of COIL, I think, in general, is that making sure that not everybody has to speak perfect English, and that was the case in my course. Mannheim students do not all speak perfect English. Those who come from history, for example, um, do not usually read his, uh, English texts. So it was also important for us to make sure, um, and as was mentioned before, that um, students are given the space to both explain where they're from, um, to have a tolerance setting in general, and we had a rubric in the beginning where we detailed all of this in the call, that we respect each other, individuals do not speak for communities, we always speak for ourselves, and um, all of these details that we thought were important, but also part of that was that um, wherever you come from, you have the space to share what your perspective is, and even if some of us cannot agree with that, we at least want to hear the explanation for, um, 
or we are open to hearing uh, what your own perspective brings to the table and where we can maybe meet and where we agree to disagree. That's also, I think, okay in COIL. It's to leave it as, okay, we do not really find a common ground here, but that's fine as well. So um, on, on the language issue, I did manage to see a little bit of, of the curriculum and I saw Gloria and Zaldua yes. uh, text. So is that, is that helpful in addressing the language issue and kind of raising awareness of the, we the actually power had dynamics? A, yeah. We actually had a student, um, because we do have many internationals in Mannheim as well, so we had one student joining us from um, Spain and she was the one who read out the parts to us that were written in Spanish. So if you don't know um, her work, um, Anzaldúa is, is someone who um, is really at home in two languages. Um, she writes about um, identities that are built at borders and borderlands. Um, so we try to make sure, I don't want to use the word authentic, but we try to make sure that this was all coming from an authentic place and we were lucky enough that we had students um, who could read the Spanish parts out to us and then explain to us in their own words what they thought um, these parts represented. So her work was actually um, a great contribution um, to our seminar. So if there are no more questions, then thank you, Abia. Thank you.